Sometimes people ask me, how come we don't have church on the Sabbath? And I just say, well, Jesus rose again on Sunday. And so the early church was like, well, why party on a Saturday when you can party on a Sunday? Works for me. You know what I mean? It's a simple logic. When did Jesus part? Sunday morning. Calm down. For whoever has entered God's rest, as Jesus, has also rested from his works as God did from his. Time this talk is finding rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that there's a rest for us. Lord, thank you that you're welcoming us home to rest. A trust rest in who you are. Learning to trust you. Learning to rest in you, God. Father, we thank you for that today. Help me to preach. And God bless Kanky right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. He needs it. Okay. I don't know if he needs it. I may just see it. I have a friend named Dylan. And um, Dylan is Australian and he's incredible. Builder. Uh, Joel, Pastor Joel Houston, rather, uh, recounts the, the tale of meeting Dylan uh, when Dylan was eight years old. And he told me, uh, Dylan was very embarrassed by this, by the way. He's probably so embarrassed by this. But Dylan's not here tonight, is he? <laughs> and that's what you get when you don't come to church. Now, um, oh! <laughs> so Dylan's dad and Dylan's uncle. Buy homes, renovate them, and sell them. And uh, so Dylan was sort of trained in, in his, his father's sh uh, shoes. Uh, and at the age of eight, Pastor Joel comes in to Dylan's father's house, and they're having a meeting, and he sees this little eight year old kid with a home like his mom had made him a tool belt. He's embarrassed about it. Make sure you rip him next time you see him. What's your tool belt from? And, um, and there he is, eight years old, just banging away. Like, this kid is wired to build. He's also in an incredible position, it's not fair. Um, I am not able to build at all. I'm a kingdom builder. Landed. And I don't know what that was. It's like Elvis in Hawaii? Uh, right, so where I came from. Um, so, so back to Dylan. Okay, so Dylan is an amazing builder. I am not an amazing builder. I'm a kingdom builder. I'm not a anything builder other than kingdom, really. Um, and so, long story short, my father in law is a builder. It's embarrassing. He thinks I'm not a man. My wife doesn't really think I'm a man either because I can't build. Because you know, I don't measure up. When I first met my father-in-law, he's like, come out on the job, mate. And I'm like, rather not, mate. You know, like, uh, <laughs> and I don't know which end of the hammer to swing, if you follow me. It's all very embarrassing. So, uh, we go to Ikea, we have an apartment, you know, we go to Ikea for $50, we buy like 30 things, and Got it delivered to our five-story walk-up. It was beautiful listening to these guys carry our bed up. You know, like, <laughs> you guys do this for a living? Uh, you'd be shocked at the people who carry things up five-story walk. And uh, so they come up, and I forgot to pay that extra bit for to get it assembled. And I, it's sort of not really. It was like 150 bucks. I was like, my mom, I you know, assembles IKEA. I can do this. Bad note. And so much respect for my mom. Now, my father is in able, unable, inability, whatever it is. Cannot build. And mom was always the one who fixed everything around us, our house. My father's a, a musician and a, and a pastor and is just not in the car. So, okay, so my mom, so I saw my mom assembling my key and I'm like, I can do this because mom does it. And no, mom is much better at life than I am. And uh, 
So I get all the stuff out, and I'm kind of thinking, you know, like I'm gonna impress my wife, and I'm gonna take pictures and send my father-in-law to rub the back in his face. It's just like, who are you now? You know, he's always like, oh, Jesus was a cop in the bank. I'm like, don't care, mate. You know, like, uh, so I get all this stuff out, and it's like, I don't know if you've ever assembled anything from Ikea, but it's a form of punishment in some countries. And, uh, I mean, God bless the Swedish, but I'm just saying, if you get caught stealing bread in Iran, you assemble Ikea things. Um, so, I don't know, that was weird. Um, so, long story short, here I am with all the directions, and it's just, it's frustrating, it's overwhelming, and I basically, I don't know what I built. It didn't look, it's supposed to be a dresser drawer. It turned into, it's like it came alive. <laughs> it took a knife out of the kitchen drawer and started to chase me around my apartment. That's not supposed to happen, I'm pretty sure. You know, it's a <laughs> you know, Dr. Frankenstein type vibes. And uh, long story short, so Dylan is around, whoa, Dylan's around, and he's in the neighborhood, and he texts me, hey, nice out, you know. I'm like, hey, hey, you know, like, I'm just hanging out. What are you doing? You want to come over for a hang somewhere? You know? Obviously, I wanted to come over and finish the job that I had, it's not even a start. He had to take everything apart, actually. So he comes, comes up, and, you know, the house is in shambles, or the apartment, rather. And I got this thing, and he's like, he starts laughing, right? And my wife is like, thank God you're here, you know, like, Thank God you're here, you know? And uh, so, so, Dylan, he's just like, get out of the way. Get out of the way. And I'm like, okay, I will get out of the way. And I sat down, and I played video games. And Dylan built everything. And following Jesus is like that. Get out of the way and let Jesus build stuff for you. <laughs> now, now you clap, okay? But it's easier said than done. And it's it's almost like this following Jesus is like we have these this moment where we're like, you know, it's like the prodigal. That he, he takes, you know, the, the, his father's inheritance and he goes out and he spends his wealth, you know, his, his father's inheritance on a wealth living and he comes to his senses in the pig pen. And we have, we all have those pig pen moments in life, right? We kind of wake up and, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a pig. What's happening? You know, like, this is not how I, this is not part of my three to five year plan. Um, and you're like, you're like, God loves me. You know, and he's for me and, 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 there's provision at Father's house, and there's rest at Father's house. So we have this come to Jesus moment where we come home, and we receive the ring and the fat calf, and we come home to Father, but then the next day, we're trying to assemble Ikea things. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? And you're like, I've got this. I'm assembling Ikea. It's like, no, you're not. You're making a total mess. Sit down. Let me do this. And so then, you know, you come to Jesus again, and then the next day, Jesus is like, put that Allen wrench down. Yeah. And you're like, I know, but I was looking at the directions, and I'm just trying to do this, and I think this is what I'm meant to do. He's like, calm down. Sit down. Get out of the way. You're making a monster. And it's, that's Christianity. That's following Jesus. Following Jesus is, I have found that the longer I have been walking with Jesus, the more I am aware of my depravity. I think a lot of us, because our, our, maybe our culture is so spiritual, we're on, on a spiritual journey, you know? Like trying to achieve super galactic omni oneness and like get in touch with my inner chi or, you know, like 
and you know, Jesus is he's a great moral teacher, and so if I come to church, then I'm gonna become a better person. Like I'm pretty up there. Like I've never killed anybody, and I'm pretty up there, and then with Jesus' help, I can be really over the top. You know, like a good person. And and the truth is that that's not really the case. And no, that's the bad news. I had good news for you, but just stick with me for the bad news for just a little bit longer. The bad news is that we are broken and we're sinners. And you know, so we come to the scriptures and we come to Jesus and we have this idea that the scriptures are a moral uplift. Uh, we look for we look for the bottom line. How do I explain this? Oh, okay, I'll do this. I'm Canadian. Okay? Let's start there. Let's talk about my Canadianness for a second. I think about God through my very Canadian cultural lens. And it's a problem. Um, basically, when you're in Canada, you come from a middle class family. They just drum into you in school, you know, don't do drugs, drugs are bad. Um, you know, don't do crime. Uh, don't have a, a child out of wedlock and graduate high school. If you do that, then life will be good to you. And, you know, that's kind of like your base morality, if that makes sense. You know, so your teachers and your community, everybody's just like, don't do those three things. Interestingly enough, my mother had a teenage pregnancy. My father was on trial for dealing drugs when he met Jesus. All my uncles went to jail, and neither of my parents graduated high school. I kind of came from, you know, that. There would be this show in Canada called Trailer Park Boys. I almost was in that show, sorry me. I would have had a rat tail and missing teeth. Drinking light beer, I don't know. Something awful. And the Lord, like, intervened. And my parents met Jesus from the age of 18. And they were adopted by a church like ours. And they had you know, spiritual fathers and mothers that taught them about life. And, and an amazing story. But I kind of come into Canadians are. We have this, 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 this saying in Canada, we call people that worry a lot a worry word, near worry word, you know. But everybody in Canada is worried. It's what we do as Canadians, we're just very concerned about everything. Just, just very concerned. I'm just very concerned, John. I'm, I'm, I'm just, Jim, I'm just very concerned about Nathan right now. I'm very concerned about him. Nathan, I'm very concerned about you. You're living in America, and you need to have, you know, if you get sick in America, son, well, then your father and I are going to lose our house. I'm very concerned about that. Like, Mom, Americans are concerned about getting sick in America, too. Everybody's concerned about that. A lot of concerns. And as a Canadian, we're concerned. We're very concerned about you. Yeah, very worried about this process and this thing and all the things. And so we work, we work because we're worried. And we're worried, so we work. And we, it's worry and work all the time. But see, the gospel is trusting and resting. It's trusting and resting in the finished work of Jesus and his ongoing work in our lives. Did you know that, that God began a good work in you and he's going to be faithful to complete it? He's going to perfect that which concerns you. God is actively, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, God is actively working in your life. It is the best thing ever to have God Almighty helping you. That is a dope plan. <laughs> Takes all the pressure off. Isn't the, isn't the gospel brilliant? God's like, yeah, you're broken. Yes, I am broken. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'm going to save you. Then I'm going to help you. Get stuff together. And you're like, you're, gonna, you're God and you're going to help me? Yes. That's, that works. That's a good plan. Good plan, God. And you work, and Paul the Apostle was like, you know, I worked so hard, but I don't even know if it was me that was working. I think it was God that was working. It, it, it's like this, this partnership where you don't even know if it's you or God, but you're just, it's synergy and you're working and things are changing. 
and the, the, the wind of heaven is at your back, and God Almighty is prospering you. The Hebrew word for prospering, getting behind somebody and pushing you. Did you know that God could prosper you? That God could get behind you and begin to push you through bondages, push you through barriers, open doors that no man can shut. God can do that. Now that's exciting. <laughs> because I can't build. And you have to come to that place where you're like, I built a, a monster. Like Eminem said, I created a monster. Write that down. Stop with the top for it. Let it minister you right now. We have to have those moments, and, but it's constant. These constant encounters with our inability and God's ability. That's our only hope. Now, this is why the Bible is so powerful. The Bible is like a mirror. And if we're reading it in the right way, in the right spirit, you're going to look at the mirror and you're going to be like, I look like that. Ew. That's disgusting. That's that. All of that. And then you and you look, then you look in the word and you see Jesus and you're like, Lord, thank you for Jesus. And then the next day you get up to the word. You know, I used to be, and sometimes I still am, because self-righteousness is sneaky. You know, Paul the Apostle said that the old man grows in corruption. You have to kill the old man every day. The problem with a living sacrifice is that it wants to keep on getting down off the altar. <laughs> Stay up there. It's <laughs> an inside job, Romans 12 thing. <sighs> so, so inside. Um, <laughs> the old man grows in corruption. And you're like, I thought I dealt with that. And then it's still there. You have to deal with it again. It's this, this process, but God's helping. So I, you know, I used to go to the scriptures, and I, would, I wouldn't see me. I was that Christian on Facebook that always was sharing scriptures for everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah, just, uh, this is my devotions. Just, sorry, honey, I'm updating my status for a moment here. Not before I, no, not before I update my status. You know? Today, as I was soaping, I heard the voice of the Lord. It's clear as a bell. You know, I, I, you're in the book of, you know, I was reading the book of Proverbs today because I need wisdom. <laughs> and uh, that's actually ruining my house. It's, un it's unfortunate. I had to rehearse that bit, and that's, um, maybe it's in tongues. Huh. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the interpretation right now. Um, so now, so you're on Facebook, and you're like, Shh, and, and you're like, you know, and, and I just came across that passage. Uh, a fool utters all his mouth. And just, I feel like some of you guys really need to allow that to seep into your spirit. You know? Share this 25 times, unless you're not really a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah, share that. Definitely share that. Um, And, and the, the point of scripture, that this is what God will do to help me see how, how bad I got it and how good Jesus is. And what he'll do is he'll bring, God will bring people into your life that will help you see yourself. If we, we're so self-deceived, you know, like, oh, I, I am just me. And the Holy Spirit are so like this all the time. And, um, you know, I, I never knew how bad I was 
until I got married. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. I have somebody on 24 hour duty pointing out all of my mistakes with joy. <laughs> you are too happy. <laughs> How many single people do we have here? You won't, you don't even know how bad you are yet. It's coming, it's coming now. Your, your turn's coming. I remember when I was just so blissful and I was just like, oh, God, I am this beautiful creation. <laughs> yeah. It was all a dream. And so then, so, so God begins to put relationships in our life, people who won't lie to us. The Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And so all of a sudden you start to walk in covenant relationship with people who actually care about you and are courageous enough to tell you the truth about yourself. And then God's beginning to talk to you. Because that's how God speaks. He speaks through relationships, Godly relationships, people who have been formed by the Word of God. And they've been through a couple battles, and, and they've been mentored as well. And, and so you begin to walk in these relationships, and they begin to tell you, you know, man, I think that's actually a problem for you. And so then you read the Word, and the Word begins to wound you, because faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so you look, you look in the mirror, and you're just like, God, is that really me? Oh, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. And you begin, that's how you encounter Jesus in the Word. And then you go to the, you know, the soap the next day. And believe me, it's, it, there, there's times when you're, you don't even want to read the Bible anymore. It sucks. You just keep on getting the beat down. You know, the Bible's like an honest old friend at that point. You're just like, you know what? I don't want to see you for a minute. You're getting a little long in the tooth. And so you read the scripture again, and you're like, oh, Lord, am I really like that? And God's like, yeah, a million times more, though. And you're like, oh, Father, thank you for Jesus. God, thank you for your mercy. Lord, thank you that you're at work in my life. Lord, thank you that I'm just even aware of this. It's just, thank you, God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, uh, you know, be careful. You know, you ask the Lord to speak to you. Who starts speaking to you? <laughs> now, I just can't. Somebody came to me recently, I just don't, can't hear the Lord. You know, like, I'm just like, well, what if he's not speaking to you about the one thing that you want him to speak to you about? And he's yelling at you about the character. <laughs> funny thing. Funny thing about God. He has a plan. But Lord, this is my plan. You're allowed to speak to me about these things. He's like, I'm shouting at you about these things. And like, I can't hear God right now. I'm just like, it's a blockage. Yeah, there's a huge blockage. It's all you. <laughs> These are... Uh, oh. Okay. Let's keep moving here. We, we come to the Word of God and we... We see the scriptures as a formula. We look for the formulas. Be careful about formulas. Um, I used to read the Bible and I'd see, like, in a moralistic sense. What I mean by that is it's like, you know, like, what are all the right things to do? So I need the right stuff. You know, like, what are all the right, you know, stories from the, from the life of David, you know, and David killed Goliath with you know, and, and it was a slingshot. And you know, it's the, reason, the reason why David killed Goliath is because he was in a worship and word every day, and he just said, he the presence of God. And then he went down to the river, and the river was really the presence of God. And he got five smooth stones, and here's five keys to defeating the giants in your life. And, and 
we, you know, David is not the hero in the story of David and Goliath. God is. He, he is. You know what you don't do? You don't bring a slingshot to a sword fight. That was a rookie move. God's like, oh great, now I have to intervene. <laughs> what were you thinking? You know, like, young shepherds don't kill wild beasts with their bare hands. God, the Spirit of God came upon David. God's the hero in those situations. But we look for these, these, these moral lessons because we think that there's something that something good that dwells in our flesh. My, Paul the Apostle said, I am convinced that there's nothing good that dwells in my flesh. We have to come to a complete and total, we have to FaceTime reality and just go, hey, you're like, yeah, I'm, I, okay, I'm going to admit it, God, there's nothing good that dwells in me, and, and I need your righteousness. So often we're trying to, uh, you know, Paul the Apostle calls it a righteousness that's not our own. And that is Jesus. Jesus is the rest from working and trying to please God and trying to get righteousness and trying to live morally so that, you know, if I do this, then God will do this. If I tithe, then God better do this. No, that's not manipulative about at all. And we have to come back to understanding that God is the hero in our stories. It's desiring to be the hero in our stories. And all of the stories in the Old Testament are about God being Lord Almighty and showing up in people's broken situations. People who didn't have it together. I can start from the very first story and work my way through all these people who are completely broken morally. God, you know, this, you know that saying, God helps those that help themselves? Guess what? It's not in the Bible. You know, if I just do this, then the Lord's going to come through. You know, like, how about he'll come through because he's good? How about, how about he'll come through because he loves you? He set his love on you. He, he gushes over you. He's obsessed with you. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. God sees, God saw you from the beginning. He's seen all of your mistakes. He sees your current struggles. He sees every mistake that you're going to make between now and when you meet him. And guess what? He's not... Up. Oh, and God's like, oh, you did? No! <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Look, I didn't either, Lord. You're acting like he's surprised. Team, why don't you come up? Team, my team. I'm going to close with this. <laughs> Adam and Eve. This is an incredible story, and it's kind of a microcosm of the whole human experience. Adam and Eve are there with God, and there's a tree, and there's all these, there's everything else. They can do anything. And God's just like, okay, that tree, don't eat the fruit, okay? And of course, what do they do? What we would have done. I'm shocked that it took, you know, two chapters for them to get in that tree. I would have been up in that tree, 20 apples in my loincloth, just like, And so what do we do when we make a mistake? We try to cover it up, right? First, the first human family, first story in the scriptures, and we got self-righteousness straight away. They're sitting there making, you know, bikini, leaf bikinis. Okay? Not going to work. God's there like, this is ridiculous. You know how stupid you look right now? You have a leaf bikini on. You can't even run 100 meters and the thing's going to fall off. First mention of self-righteousness, right there. It's what we do, always try to cover our back. And so what does God do? Takes a goat, type of Christ. Kills the goat. First mention of, a, of, a, of death in the scripture. Skins the goat and makes a covering for them. 
makes clothes for them. God will always have to cover you. You will never be able to cover yourself. Ever. We have to return to this rest in God. Our, when we make a mistake, what do we want to do? We want to run them out. We still do it as Christians. I'm not going to church this Sunday. I threw a hammer at Rick again at work. You know? Yeah, I, I was going to serve on the reading team, but I got a little bit mad at little Johnny the other day. And I might have said a curse word, and I'm not proud of myself, and I'm going to whip myself right now. You know, like... And, and, and God's just like, what are you talking about? I've already covered you. Return to my rest. Trust Jesus, my provision, my rest. Cease from your works. Come home. Come home to Jesus, the Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath day is, this, is a radical idea in, a, in an agricultural society. Taking a day off, you didn't take a day off in an agricultural society. If you did that, you'd starve. But God just said, look, I want to be, I want you to trust me on this. You work six days, I'm going to work one day. And believe me, in one day, I'm going to make up for everything and then some. I want to be God in your situation. I want you to rest in me. Rest in my ability. Trust me with this job. Trust me with your dream. Trust me with your prayers. Trust me with your relationship. Obey and trust and rest in my provision. But folks, I, I believe that God wants to be the hero in our city. God wants to be the hero in our families. God wants to be the hero in our circumstance. And we begin to just worship like we're releasing Him. Lord, this is your Sabbath. This is your day. I'm resting. I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to trust in only you. Nobody can add to your perfection. You're the beginning and the end more than I can even comprehend. There's nobody like you, God. Church, why don't you stand with me? If, you're, if, you're, if that's you tonight and you're going, you got some things that you're carrying and you've been working and there's, work is good. we got to give God something to bless. God directs steps. That's important. But that's you and you're going, and you feel tired. You feel worn out. You feel like you've been kind of doing some things and trying to get God's attention. And you feel like you need to lift it to the Lord tonight. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hand to the Lord all over this place. And I'm going to pray for you. Father, we lift, we lift up all of these needs to you. But we lift up our work to you, God. God, we're asking you that you would be the difference maker in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. Father, I thank you that you can do more in one day than we can do in six. And God, we return to rest in you. Lord, we trust in you. You are Lord Almighty. There is nobody like you. We worship you, God, and we release these things to you. God, knowing that you are faithful and you're trusted. Maybe you've never come home to Father. Maybe you've been waiting to get your life together. You're like, you know, when I, when I, when I do this, when I do this, I got this, and I'm going to get involved in church, and I'm going to come to God, and I'm going to clean myself up first. Friend, you will never be able to clean yourself up good enough for God. Never. God loves you just the way you are. And he loves you and he wants you just the way you are. And he's provided a covering and a rest for you. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross for your sins. He took all of your sins upon his body. And he rose again in power. And he loves you. And if you will trust Jesus and his finished work, you will be saved. I want to invite you, if you've never responded to the gospel before, to come to the Father tonight and rest. Cease from your work. Cease from your labor and trust Jesus. If that's you and you've never made that decision before, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to lift your hand right where you are to God. All over this room, if that's you, just lift your hand to the Lord. Just go, yes, I'm coming home to the Father. I'm going to trust the Father. His hands going up all over the place. Come on, that's you, right now. This is between you and God. 
Church, help me give these folks a hand.